Okay, good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome to this uh, afternoon session on behalf of Pete Milner and I. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Matt James. Um, after holding senior roles in uh, a number of private healthcare organizations, he uh, founded the um, Private Healthcare Information Network in 2012. Uh, and he's here today in his capacity as the, uh, as the CEO to explain about its role and also its uh, strategic plan going forwards. As I remember, this has been quite, a, this has stimulated quite lively discussion in the past. So I'd encourage you all to uh, add your comments to the chat and uh, Pete and I will do our best to put as many of your questions and uh, concerns should you have any still to uh, Matt at the end. Uh, so Matt, I'll hand over to you now. Good afternoon. My name's Matt James. I'm the Chief Executive of the Private Healthcare Information Network, usually known as FIN. And firstly, let me say a quick thank you to Lee Breakwell and the UK SSB committee for kindly inviting me to address you today. So I'm going to share my screen and talk to you about FIN. <clears throat> uh, I'll start with a quick reminder of what FIN is. Go on to just uh, explain to those who haven't come across us before what that means for you. And then I'm going to spend most of the time on our plan for the next five years. Uh, which is what Lee has asked me to focus on and hopefully provide a little bit of reassurance to people uh, about the journey ahead. So FIN is the independent government mandated source of information on private healthcare in the UK. Uh, it sounds very official and I will be getting into talking a little bit about legislation and obligations and things like that. But the basic reason we're here is that we believe that transparency and better information enables informed choice and better care for patients. And what that means in practice is that FIN produces a website where patients can log on, search for information about the local hospital or local consultants. Typically, a patient uh, searches uh, our website after they've been referred by their GP to go and find a consultant. So they can put in an area and a procedure and a consultant name if they have one. And when they hit the search button there, they will get a range of information uh, a list of consultants, for example, um, that says how far away those consultants practice, what kind of procedures they do, which hospitals they work at, how many patients they see, typical lengths of stay for some procedures and so on. And if they click on that consultant's profile, they'll get further information, such as the biographical information that the consultants put there themselves and uh, information about clinical measures, the hospitals that the consultant practices at, and if they choose to, they can look for fees information, uh, starting here with this example with outpatient fees, and then you can click on the drop down and see fees for the particular procedures that consultants do. So fairly self-explanatory, and indeed this, this entire website is getting a complete overhaul later in the year to make it even friendlier to patients based on uh, primary research that we did. So there you have it. Um, and what does that mean for you? Well, the first thing it means for consultants, I'm afraid to say, is that there are some things to do. Um, we do ask you to log on to our uh, secure portal, to create a profile, to enter your fees information so it can be displayed, and to validate your activity data. And I know that many of you have already done this, and thank you for doing that. So around 70% of spinal surgeons have logged on, uh, and nearly half have created a profile, more than half uh, have entered fees information, um, but only around 15%, only about one in six currently have validated performance measures for publication. And that's something we clearly need to look at and work on with you um, to make sure that uh, you feel comfortable in the way that we're presenting the data and that the data coming through from your hospitals is where it should be. And I'll come back to that uh, very shortly. So you know, your experience, I'll touch on this briefly, but this won't become a how-to guide. Um, we're not hard to find, just do something simple like Google Finn Consultant Portal um, and you'll find your way uh, in a couple of steps to the Finn Portal and there's lots of information on here, there's news specifically aimed at consultants and hospitals who are participating, there's more information about who Finn is, about our mandate from the Competition and Markets Authority, um, about how you do things like submit fees and log on um, and you'll find uh, contact details if you would like to get in touch with us, that's uh, with Anne Coyne, our consultant relationships manager, or Ellie Griffiths, who works with her. And you'll find various videos, for example, teaching you uh, how to, to do these things in more detail. Um, so if you click on that video there, you will find your way pretty quickly to Ellie. 
and she'll give you a quick rundown. And very soon you'll find yourself looking at your personal practice report made from the data that we've assembled about you from various hospitals. And this, of course, by default shows you the private practice that you do, but it has the NHS data that's in NHS HES as well. Now, some of you may be becoming familiar with that data, so you can get a whole practice position, potentially very useful for appraisal and revalidation. <clears throat> so um, that's it really uh, on the on the how to guide. Um, uh, people sometimes ask me if it's compulsory. Well, the, the basic answer, I'm afraid, is yes, some of it is, notably uh, submitting your fees data to us. And you'll be aware, of course, uh, that you actually are obliged to mention FIN and refer your patients to FIN as the independent source of information about private healthcare uh, when you send them letters prior to outpatient consultations or prior to treatment. Uh, it's not mandatory to create a profile, but it works pretty well for marketing. That's up to you. And we do encourage people to get involved and validate their data. So our uh, strategic plan for the next five years. Um, we took up the, the role with the CMA actually in 2015 due to delays with COVID. We didn't move ahead with our new strategy last year. We're doing that from 21 to 25, but we did run a consultation in October of last year when we had a lull in the, in the COVID shenanigans. And that had a very good response um, from a broad range of stakeholders across the private healthcare industry and the public sector, including the CMA, the CQC, uh, uh, in particular in relation to consultants from the Royal College of Surgeons, British Orthopaedic Association, FSSA, and so on, uh, which hopefully should reassure you that the voice of consultants is being heard. And so we've set out four agreed strategic priorities now following that consultation. The first of which is complete and accelerate delivery of the Competition Markets Authority's private healthcare order. Get it done was the message that we got clearly from stakeholders. Um, it should have been done by April 2017. We've deliberately gone slowly because we believe that getting it right is better than doing it too fast. Um, but now the emphasis is on getting it done for the next five years. And I'll come back to explain a little bit about what that looks like. Second thing is to focus more on patient and consumer benefit. The first five years of, uh, of Finn's role has really been about establishing the pathways um, and building the infrastructure that was needed to get data in. And now the next five years is about getting information out and doing a much better job of understanding what patients and consumers want in terms of information about private healthcare and giving it to them in the way that they find easiest to use. Third thing is about creating value for participating stakeholders, that's you, alongside the hospitals and insurers and other people who are required to participate. Um, we don't believe there's any conflict in trying to make this work for the people who are participating. In fact, we think that's necessary to get the best job done for patients. Of course, if there's ever any conflict between the interests of patients uh, and uh, providers, then the interests of patients must prevail. But generally nine times out of 10, we think it's possible to align people's interests and actually do things that work for consultants and for hospitals. And fourthly, um, <clears throat> our priority is to deliver a collaborative and efficient model. Now, in terms of managing FIN, that sort of speaks for itself. We want to be efficient. We want to uh, not spend more money than we have to. Our money comes from subscriptions from private hospitals, but ultimately that means uh, that it comes from patients. But it actually means a little bit more than that. Um, we've become quite involved in the Medicines and Medical Devices Review, the Patterson Inquiry and so on. And it's really shown us over the last few years that there's far too much duplication uh, in the collection of hospital data. And we think that can be addressed. And we're working with a range of partners under the Acute Data Alignment Programme, it's another acronym for you, uh, normally known as ADAPT, um, which is sponsored by the Secretary of State and is actually making real progress in trying to align our data processes with those used in the NHS so that we end up with a much more streamlined process, um, which should primarily actually benefit consultants, to be honest. <clears throat> So I, I talked about getting the CMA's order done. Um, the CMA asked for 11 categories of performance measure. So this is the sort of clinical focus as opposed to fees. Um, and some of them are pretty basic, volumes and length of stay, moving on to infection rates, healthcare associated infections, surgical site infections, and some fairly standard things like readmission rates, revision rates, mortality uh, rates, and so on. Um, through patient feedback and satisfaction, uh, into proms measures and so on. Um, now, we don't have time to get too much into these right now, but I'll just say a few things about them. So firstly, as at March 2021, 
Um, we've started publication in six categories for the hospitals, um, picking out the simpler measures generally, but only two for the consultants. So right now, all that we're publishing is volumes and lengths of stay, which patients do find helpful, but we haven't yet got into the difficult stuff. And actually, in terms of completion, it's slightly less flattering picture because, um, as mentioned earlier, only around 15% of consultants in spinal surgery, and about 20% across all specialties, have yet approved their data for publication. Now, five years or six years into our work as the information organisation and three years after the CMA required that this job be completed, we really need to address that quite quickly. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about how we're going to do that. But the point now is to make progress uh, towards better completion. In terms of performance measures, there are things that we'd like to do to keep it simple. So, for example, take relevant information from registries and audits. Uh, we have long maintained a dialogue with the British Spine Registry. It's gone quiet for the last couple of years, which is probably our fault. We'd like to pick that back up. Look at the data that the British Spine Registry is being published. It is publishing. If we can reuse it, and that's the easiest thing for consultants, the thing that the data that you most trust, that you recognise, if we can reuse it, that's fantastic. If we can't, then maybe we can reach an agreement about how things can be measured anyway, or what are the most relevant topics. We are aware, for example, that when GERFT, the Getting It Right First Time programme, started to look at spinal surgery, they went in a different direction. They didn't take data directly from the spine registry. They recreated data from a different source. So that already leaves Finn in the position that we'd like to work as closely as possible um, with the specialty associations and using the data and the measures that already exist and simply extending those in terms of how they reach consumers. Um, but there's a, a little bit of negotiation to do, I think, around exactly what that looks like over the next few years. But that will be our approach. We don't want to invent from scratch. We'd much rather work with you and take the things which are already there. And I'm particularly just going to address very quickly uh, that th theme in terms of adverse events. Um, there are some adverse events which are suitable for publication at hospital level which aren't necessarily suitable for publication at consultant level so in a hospital level we started with never events um uh i'm told that that is not going to work at uh, consultant level um so uh, we will do with adverse events what makes most sense and as i say you've already decided on what measures are most appropriate to uh to care in spinal surgery by and large uh, you're doing that within the specialty associations, within the existing registries. So what we want to do is work with that and align to it, uh, not invent anything new or go off in a different direction. Um, and the principal point is we are a consulting organisation ourselves. At every stage, we have involved representatives uh, of, of the professional bodies in uh, our discussions. And so we work with people to make sure that we do things in the right way. So please don't panic. Um, <clears throat> just to re-emphasise that, look, we've got no interest in publishing misleading information. We've always maintained the position that for our information to be useful to patients, our data must first be trusted by clinicians. We will consult widely on our methods. And as you can see from the fact that it's now 2021, when we were originally told by the CMA, get this done by April 2017, we're really not rushing. In fact, we've come to an accommodation with the CMA over the last few years, whereby we've helped them to understand the complexity involved in publishing data at um, uh, 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 in healthcare and particularly as you start to address individual practitioners and um, we brought them to an understanding I think that that needs to be done properly and in a measured way. So there is one change that I do want to talk very briefly about because you may want to pick up on it in questions and this is to try to address the fact that only 15-20% of consultants have so far validated their data. Now, at the moment, contrary to what the CMA asked us to do, so contrary to the legal obligations under which FIN finds itself, we put in a process that allows consultants to validate their data prior to publication and actually says we won't publish information until a consultant has positively validated their data. I.e., If you don't log on, if you just ignore the whole process, we, we don't currently publish information about you. Understandably, several years into this, the CMA is getting a little bit anxious to see a bit more progress. So. What we are proposing to do <clears throat> in a year or so's time, giving us plenty of time uh, to consult on and design uh, a process that will work, is that whilst all consultants will still be asked and reminded to validate their data, there will still be plenty of opportunity to work with hospitals to resolve any issues and there will be time to fix it. 
at the end of that validation process, what we're proposing is that we will publish the data unless we've been made aware that there is a problem and the plan to fix it. So the default will move from don't publish to do publish, but there will still be plenty of opportunity uh, to fix issues um, and to raise those issues um, if they exist and, and uh, people are planning to fix them. And that's the that's process we call presumed publication. I'm very happy to take questions on that uh, later on if that would help. So I think I'll wrap it up there because I'm aware of time. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, speaking to you in the question session. And for now, thanks and goodbye. Microphone back on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I should also mention that in the in the question and answer session, uh, uh, John Fistein's uh, joined us. He's the um, chief medical officer for Finn, and he's uh, there to assist with any questions that need to be answered. Um, the first one came from Chris Adams, uh, Matt, uh, and John. It was on conversion rates. Um, is there any plan to publish conversion rates for? not only surgical procedures, but also um, less interventional procedures like nerve root injections and also maybe uh, MRI investigations. Is, that may be important to patients, particularly if they're self-funding, they'll want to know the likelihood of being uh, landed with a bigger bill with certain surgeons, maybe. Well, the short answer here is we would love to, but there is a problem or, or arguably even sort of two problems with that. The first, I mean, the, the key issue is we don't have access to outpatient or diagnostic data. And we don't have it because the CMA um, in, uh, in not its finest moment, arguably, specifically excluded outpatient activity data from the scope of its order. Um, and I was rather hoping, I have to say, that the recommendation of the Patterson inquiry, where I hammered home to the inquiry during the course of its investigations, um, what a big issue that was, would um, be fairly explicit uh, about the need to include diagnostic and outpatient information, particularly because what Ian Patterson did, you will, I'm sure, be aware, was exploit the gap in knowledge between what had happened in at the diagnostic stage and then taking patients onto treatment where the diagnosis didn't support it. That didn't happen either, actually. Um, so I'm, I still remain hopeful that DHSC might, in its wisdom and its response, enable us to do that but for now we don't have that data um, so I can completely see and appreciate um, the benefit in in doing those conversion rates and and looking at um, outpatient diagnostic information for a number of other reasons um, but if we're going to do that it's one of many examples of where the sector needs to come together decide it's the right thing to do and just get it done anyway which requires some joint uh, joint agreement, I think, between the consulting, uh, the consultants' representative bodies, the hospitals, uh, and possibly the insurers as well. Thanks for that response, Matt. The, uh, there's another question from uh, Chris, Chris Lee, who asked you about the impact of COVID, really, and and how you see that may have impacted upon the the provision of this data and activity in general. Yeah, I mean, clearly COVID had an impact. I mean, private healthcare as a whole in 2020 was about 25 or 30 percent down on what it would be in a normal year, what it was on, you know, where it was in 2019. We suspended uh, collection for a while and then our collection was slightly delayed in the second half of last year. Um, but as actually, um, as at the beginning of March, we've, we've caught back up. Um, the hospitals have done a, a great job at um, catching up with the data. So we do at least have an accurate picture now of what happened in 2020. Um, clearly, uh, activity is down and clearly that will have affected some hospitals and some consultants more than others. So, for example, private patient units and any consultants who practice in private patient units have seen a far bigger drop in their uh, in their practice um, than those who practice in, in other independent hospitals. Okay. Several questions coming in now, Matt, on the validation of surgeon data. Yep. Um, uh, Pete's asked if it is if it is published unvalidated, will it be made clear that it's unvalidated? Um, and I think uh, Neil Orpen and one other question, John Leach, uh, have raised concerns about the ability to correct data when it's wrong. 
Uh, so, firstly, I uh, don't know, seems like a perfectly good idea to indicate that it hasn't been validated. That seems very sensible, and it's exactly the sort of thing which we would hope would come up um, during a consultation process, which is likely to run over a period of months and hopefully involve, involve a wide um, uh, number of participants in that. But that seems eminently sensible, so um, hopefully we can log that somewhere and, uh, and take that in. Um, and then to... To Neil's question, I mean, um, so let's start with a view. We'd much rather only publish data that has been validated, but that does require that consultants get involved and come in and actively validate their data. Um, when you say in that written question that consultants can't correct data retrospectively with hospitals, that is true in respect of NHS data at NHS hospitals. It's not necessarily true, or at least should not be true in respect of private data um at independent hospitals currently um it should still be able to correct things and indeed it has to be corrected at source because whenever we find data errors the thing we know is that um you know th that error in the information doesn't exist in fin systems it exists in the hospital systems um, which immediately gives you issues around data protection rights in terms of the patient because it means that erroneous data is being held about their care and so on. So th there's an imperative to fix that at source. Now, in the private data and the process we've uh, created for that, um, whilst it does need effort to fix it, as far as we're aware, it can be done. The issue comes when we move across to start looking at the NHS HES data. Um, and it's, we probably don't have time to get into it, but that's one of the biggest issues we face with the acute data alignment program and our attempts to try to streamline the process so that data only flows once and consultants only have to check it once is frankly, we have to persuade NHS Digital and NHS England that they need a validation process and they have to really consider the ultimate clinical validity and the processes for ensuring clinic, clinical validity in the HES data. Um, it's not there at the moment. Um, but a key component of doing this stuff right will require that there is that process, uh, you know, a few years from now. Okay. Thanks, Matt. I had, a, I had a question. I just wondered why you chose length of stay as one of the first key performance indicators instead of, say, readmission rate, because that might encourage surgeons to uh, reduce their length of stay but have uh, more readmissions due to that uh, reduction. Sure. I mean, um, look, it, it really comes down to um, simplicity and availability of the information and frankly, wanting to start with things which are relatively uncontentious. I mean, we report length of stay without any implication that shorter is better or longer is better. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And there are various stories that go around length of stay. Um, but um, uh that's at least open to interpretation. Um, the admission rate by and large should be a little bit more um, linear and directive, I would think. Um, so we probably will start to publish some readmission rates uh, this year. What we have is we know how many uh, readmissions a given hospital count coming back uh, to themselves. Um, the process of calculating readmissions in the way that the NHS does it by looking at where where patients might be readmitted anywhere and obviously it's pretty common to readmit back into the NHS for more complicated um, post-surgical issues um, uh, you know the, the more complicated the surgery the more complicated the issue the more likely it is they readmit into the NHS that's a bit harder to count and we're working on that it's something we're, we're actively taking forward with NHS digital won't be in the first round but it, it probably will be in the second so we hope to get some of that this year at hospital level, but we're going to follow a process all the way through, Neil, which is we'll publish things at hospital level first. Once we've worked the kinks out, then we'll take them to consultant level. Matt, thank, thanks again. Um, we're about halfway through the session, so yeah. thank you very much for your answers. Sure. I'll, I'll well. hand over to Pete and uh, then uh, we'll hear the next speaker. Thank you very much. So, so thanks, Matt. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, that discussion will carry on through the discussion forum in the, back in the lobby. Um, so without further ado, I want to move on to our next speaker update. So my consultant colleague in Leeds, Simon Britton. So Simon graduated from Southampton and uh, was in the army for a while, did a lot of his training down in the southwest and also at the Lizarov Institute in Russia, which explains why he speaks Russian and few other East European languages. He's a trauma and limb reconstruction surgeon who's been uh, very heavily involved in T 
teaching and training our juniors, not only in limb reconstruction, but in medical legal matters. He's a past president of our local medical legal society, and he sits on one of the BOA committees on medical legal affairs. He's completed an LLM with distinction in medical jurisprudence and is currently studying for a PhD in medical law. We've asked him to talk today a little bit more about informed consent and negligence. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Simon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk this afternoon about consent and negligence. My name's Simon Britton. I'm a consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon at Leeds Teaching Hospitals. Lord Denning, former master of the roles, once said, every surgical operation is attended by risks. We cannot take the benefits without taking the risks. The purpose of consent, let's consider that for a second, is it to cover ourselves, to cover our backsides, or is it the entire basis on which we are permitted to treat patients? Society and the law are set up in such a way that with certain provisions in place, we can carry out procedures that would otherwise constitute grievous bodily harm or battery. We went up to people in the street and amputated one leg and drilled multiple holes into their other leg. Uh, this would uh, not be ideal. The reason we go about doing this surgery is to improve future outcome. Back in 1940, 1914 in the United States, Judge Cardozo said that every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what should be done with his body. This is really the first judicial statement of autonomy uh, back then. And yet, how long did it take to translate into legal terms in the United Kingdom? It was not until the incorporation of the European uh, Judgment on Human Rights in 1998 in the Human Rights Act that Article 8, the so-called autonomy article, was incorporated. Everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. And this so-called autonomy article has been used uh, to justify autonomy uh, amongst the population. And by the 1990s, on the back of things such as the Human Rights Act, there was increasing acceptance by courts that failure to disclose material risk in consent was unacceptable. This all fitted with a shift to a consumer culture and the consumer having it uh, their way. It was not until 2004 in Chester versus Afshar that Lord Stain uh, stated, in modern law, medical paternalism no longer rules. So we're coming to the end of Doctor Knows Best and uh, we're really looking at the rise of autonomy and patient-driven decision-making. In Montgomery in 2015, adults of sound mind right to choose which treatment, consent must be obtained prior to embarking there's a duty to disclose any material risks, i.e. what the patient might consider important, the duty to disclose any reasonable treatment alternatives. This is 100 years, 101 years, since Judge Cardozo uh, set out his statement on autonomy. What flows from Montgomery? Well, in the current medico-legal climate, the court will directly and simply apply the Montgomery judgment to cases coming before them. This gives, on the whole, predictable outcomes. The court will be looking for all material risks have been disclosed. There's been adequate time and space to consider uh, treatment options. All reasonable treatment options have been discussed. And yet, we must not bombard the patient with excessive information. So what is material risk? Lord Scarman said, material risk. A reasonable person in the patient's position, if warned of the risk, would be likely to attach significance to it. It has more simply been stated as, 
anything to which the patient may attach importance. Uh, this is a pretty uh, generous and uh, broad definition. There is a two-armed test for material risk. It's not what the patient thinks is important, plus what the doctor thinks is important to the patient. It's more subtle than that. There is an objective arm, what the reasonable patient in that position would need to know. There is a subjective arm, what risks in the doctor's view the particular patient would consider important. And it's doubly subjective. What in the doctor's view, you have to imagine what that might be. The particular patient is subjective to that individual patient as well. I think the subjective arm can be really quite tricky and also can be rather helpful to claimant solicitors. In terms of satisfying the objective arm, patient information leaflets may contribute a long way towards covering the objective arm. Uh, although note that the reading age of reading leaflets must be reasonable. And in terms of the subjective arm, we are expected to get to know the individual patient. And whether this is over a few mojitos in the bar or, you know, it's uh, really extremely subjective and not that scientific, I would say. We must allow adequate time and space for decision-making. The patient has to have time to consider options. Consent is a process over time, it's not a signature on a form. Things which I think are worth avoiding, in elective surgery in particular, a consent form signed at the first meeting, how can they have had time to consider options? Uh, the good old patient in the surgical, surgical gown on a trolley heading for theatre, um, and there are also issues surrounding dignity, privacy, confidentiality and also patients have reported feeling vulnerable in uh, such situations but also it's worth avoiding introducing new information on the day of surgery we are expected to discuss all reasonable treatment options now i think it's worth bearing in mind there are alternative treatments which may or may not be reasonable so just because something is an alternative doesn't mean it's a reasonable treatment option. Um, we would be expected to discuss the implications of doing nothing. What will be the natural history of the condition if no treatment at all is carried out? And we must also demonstrate that non-operative treatment modalities have been at the very least considered, if not So what constitutes reasonable treatments and who decides? Is it the patient? They can't force a surgeon to do an operation. And it's well recognized in law that if a surgeon feels an operation would not be in the patient's best interests, uh, then they can't be forced to do it. And it will put the surgeon in a very invidious position. Um, is it the treating doctor who decides? Well. You know, I don't believe in frames or I don't believe in shin rods or whatever it might be. Well, you know, that, is, you know, that isn't necessarily reasonable treatment option and reasonable consideration. It is specialty guidelines, although uh, there are some commentators that suggest that in Montgomery, the sort of index case itself, the treatment uh, recommended by the Supreme Court deviate, expected by the Supreme Court, deviated from the Royal College of Obstetricians specialty guidelines in force at the time. This is expert opinion evidenced by Bolan, uh, which decides what is a reasonable treatment option. Or is it the Supreme Court? I think when we see the logical progression of cases, including Montgomery, ultimately, while the surgeon offers the treatment, it may in fact be the Supreme Court who decide what is a reasonable treatment option. The cases which may well be familiar to you, I've stuck to a couple of spinal cases just to illustrate some of these points. Um, 
if you're out there, any of you surgeons involved in these cases, uh, welcome. Uh, Thiefo versus Johnson. Spinal case, excuse my lower limb specialist uh, assessment of what the case involved, spinal case. Initial consultation, then a five minute phone call. Complication was sustained. Uh, the court found surgery was not performed negligently. However, the benefits of surgery were, had been overstated. The risks had been downplayed. But the court found there had been insufficient time and space for reasonable dialogue. The court found that if, the, if properly advised, the patient would have deferred surgery or sought a second opinion. And the court found that negligent consent caused the recognised complication. Jones versus Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital, spinal case. On the morning of surgery, the patient was informed that the surgery would be carried out by the fellow, not by the very experienced consultant. Complication was sustained. The court, the court found surgery was not performed negligently, but the patient had been led to believe that the consultant would be doing the operation. Expert evidence was adduced that the greater seniority and experience of the lower the complication rate and, quote, the right to make an informed choice as to who would operate on her, unquote, had been infringed, thereby denying her autonomy and dignity. And uh, this stands in contradiction to one of the clauses on our consent forms where it says that we can't guarantee that a specific surgeon will carry out the procedure. Informed on the morning of surgery, the change of surgeon allowed insufficient time and space to reach an autonomous decision, and the case was found in favour of the claimant. But this is a warning to all surgeons in both Thiefaut and, jo and Jones. While the technical aspects of surgery leading to a complication were found not to be negligent, the claimant's case in negligence was found on the basis that the surgeon had not obtained valid consent. Another case which may be familiar to you, Hassel versus uh, Hillingdon Hospitals, spinal cord injury in cervical spine surgery. The court found the risk of paralysis was not mentioned in clinic. The consent form signed on the day of surgery did mention paralysis. Justice Dingermans found that consent on the day of surgery was rushed. Adequate time and space was not allowed. Non-operative treatment had not been offered, and the case settled for £4.4 million. Pounds. So what is the cost of consent? What's the cost of doing it properly? Uh, Birch and Todd, excellent article in the Bone and Joint Journal last year, they demonstrated savings to the public purse far outweigh the costs of ensuring Montgomery compliant consent processes, i.e. allowing for extra time in clinic adjusting uh, how we go about seeking consent and going through the consent process with our patients saves tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of pounds. But of course to any individual trust those costs come out of a different budget. So, so far in this talk we've had a one-legged man right back at the start. We've had a two-armed test for material risk. The only way we could possibly go now is to a three-legged stool. Yeah, you may well be familiar with the three-legged stool work from Ipswich. Uh, here are the, uh, the usual suspects from Ipswich, uh, from East Anglia, set out there. Um, the three-legged three -le three stool uh, system for spinal informed consent based around information, communication with the patient through information booklets and diagrams. An emphasis on patient-centred dialogue uh, to ensure picking up, getting to know the patient and what their concerns may be. And then a surgeon-guided completion of the consent form. And the three-legged stool picks up most of the pitfalls which I've described so far in the talk. So, Lord Denning once said, every surgical operation is attended by risks. We cannot take benefits without taking the risks. Thank you very much. 
Thanks very much, Simon. So a few questions. Um, if you can take this question from Dimitri van Popter. So he's asked, what if a surgeon just didn't feel the surgery is warranted, but doesn't have objective reasons for that decision? So gut instinct, I suppose, or... Yeah, so it, it really um, enters into the realm of reasonable treatment options. And um, if one has some objective reasons why um, the surgery isn't warranted, it would be far easier to firstly explain to the patient and secondly, subsequently justify that decision in court. I think that sort of X factor, it just doesn't feel right. Uh, that may be a case to take to the MDT meeting and also to discuss with colleagues. But uh, if you don't think the patient will benefit from the surgery, you don't have to do it. And if you don't think the treatment is reasonable, in theory at least, you don't have to discuss it. If it's not reasonable, Montgomery doesn't expect you to discuss it. And that would then enter a debate, that would then lead to a discussion uh, if it went to court. Evidence would be adduced by one side saying, that this treatment option was reasonable and evidence would be adduced by the other side saying it wasn't a reasonable treatment option and the judge would have to decide. Excellent. So there's a, there's one, a question from Steve Vogel. Uh, could we reframe consent as an opportunity to work in partnership with patients to promote therapeutic alliance and adherence to advice as well as adhering to evidence-based medicine? So, so could we uh, frame it in those uh, terms. Yes, yes, we could. And in fact, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons latest guidance, um, and then more recently, the guidance from the General Medical Council, which was updated in autumn last year, all really refer to um, helping, enabling and facilitating the patient to decide uh, with the surgeon facilitating that decision. Good. And there's a, there's a good question from Charles Davis uh, from Preston, which is very similar to one I was going to ask you. Charles is asking, the importance of Montgomery is options. Currently, the three-legged school needs another leg, i.e. the option of non-surgery should be discussed and must be annotated. So it was something I wanted to ask you was, how far do we go then in discussing outcomes without surgery, without going ahead with a particular procedure? Yes. So I think, I think you have to start with um, the, na the natural history of the condition if nothing whatsoever is done. And um, to give the patient some idea of um, you know, what will happen if you do nothing. And you guys will know best than me in terms of things like um, a disc, uh, which may, may settle over uh, weeks to months uh, as opposed to requiring surgery and having the experience to know which will settle and which may not. Um, but firstly, discussing doing nothing at all. How do we see things panning out? And then the question surrounding non-operative measures and we, we have this in limb reconstruction, uh, things like leg lengthening, where the patient is absolutely adamant that they will not try a shoe raise. And so you have a situation where you want to be seen to be demonstrating that you've offered non-operative treatment, but the patient is sort of, you know, is really out for a leg lengthening or uh, a leg, sh leg shortening on the other side. And I think in those circumstances, one should make it clear it's been offered and make it clear that it's, that it's been point blank uh, refused. And once that is documented, you can then move on to doing what surgeons like doing, which is doing operations. But having covered and cleared the other matters uh, and clearly documented in the notes up to that point. Um, a very, uh, very good question here from Ray Ross, raising the problems many of us are facing these days with pooled, pooled waiting lists. Uh, who becomes liable if a patient's operated on from a pulled waiting list? How do we deal with that as a consent issue if there's a negligent act? Uh, yes, it's um, well, it, this will often the pulled pulled waiting list scenario will be in an NHS situation. So, of course, um, the um, organisation sued will be the trust and the trust will be defending on behalf of the various uh, surgeons involved. It would then come down uh, to really the relative roles of uh, the various surgeons who assessed the patient in clinic, who went through the consenting process, who did the surgery, 
Um, and it depends then if breaches of duty are identified, who was responsible for those breaches of duty? Or do we say in the end, it was a systems error and it was in fact the trust which breached that duty. And that comes right back to, it is the trust that is liable. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much. There are lots of questions coming up, which we're not going to be able to handle, but uh, perhaps we can pick those up through the chat uh, chat function. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Chat. Thanks. And thank you for everybody for signing in and watching this talk. So we'll close it there. Thank you.